And we're back to manners to break down the drums and bass. If this is the first video you've seen from the series, I've already broken down the guitars last week, and even the lyrics the week before. But today we're getting down to the absolute insanity of the rhythm section. If you want to see more videos like this, I'd really appreciate if you would like the video and subscribe. But anyway, let's do this. Akane leads us into the song with a measure of eighth notes on the snare. This intro was actually very confusing to me the first time I heard it because Mincho's riff picks up on the second eighth note, which is right between the one and the two count of the measure, giving it a really intriguing hook for someone who likes to hear weird stuff in music. And Akane's drum pattern for the intro integrates a lot of interesting double kick patterns. Constantly changing the texture from measure to measure, keeping me on my toes. Her drum fill to lead into the verse also uses the double kick nicely using 16th notes on the kick to lead into 8th notes on the snare and toms, which is a reversal of more common drum fills, which usually start with snare or toms first before adding kick. Okane introduces another set of new patterns on the kick drum for the verse. Continuing into the post chorus, her kick patterns perfectly fit under Mincho's lead riff to help it stand out. Then this fill leading into the pre-chorus is just absolute class. Adding some embellishments between the eighth notes across the kit. The pre-chorus switches to a four on the floor kick to leave room for the lead riff to really shine, while bolstering it all the same. And to lead into the chorus, Akane plays another fill that begins on the kick. And this fill was straight up disorienting for me the first several times I tried to play it. Again, it's just such a reversal of the common drum fills led by the dominant hand. But Akane always seems to love a challenge. Now the chorus features another set of cool double patterns. Adding some nice rests and syncopation to keep it bouncy for the first half, then switching to an eight on the floor with the snare on the downbeats for a measure, then another change up for the fourth pattern, doing some cool bounces between the snare and kick. And the main riff returns with the same pattern as the intro, but true to the bandmade way, Akane introduces another new pattern for the second verse, leaving out the hi-hats, and doing some cool hype building beats with the flammed snares. Then she adds in hi-hat for the second half of the verse and then accentuates Mincho's octave riff at the end of the verse with Tom and hi-hat in unison. The post-verse and pre-chorus are about the same this time around, but the end of the pre-chorus has this beautiful triplet fill. Starting with 16th note triplets and fading into 8th note triplets, and then introducing the second chorus with another hype building fill. Speaking of which, the fill after the second chorus leading to the guitar solo also builds some nice hype. Now for the solo, the drums are about the same as the chorus, but for the second half, they switch to an eight on the floor on the double kick to add to that rising buildup feeling throughout the solo. Now the bridge has the coolest drums of the whole song in my opinion. The patterns are complex, so I'll just play it for you. And then the fill leading into the last chorus is absolutely insane, playing 32nd notes with crazy accents, then fading into 8th note triplets to ease into the chorus. This is insanely difficult at the tempo of manners. Now the last chorus is like a stretched out version of the guitar solo section, beginning with that original chorus structure, but then shifting to eight on the floor double kicks halfway through. And then Akane does a simple eighth note snare fill to abruptly end the song into the vocal and looped ending. Now there's a reason I saved the bass for last. Misa is an absolutely insane musician. Her bass parts melted my mind while I was learning the song. 
as she opens the track bolstering the lead guitar riff and rhythm guitar at the same time playing the root notes of both She does this nice little lick to introduce us into the verse. Now for the first verse, she lets the A root ring, but adds a couple funky licks at the end of each progression. Again, she plays along with the post verse and pre-chorus riffs, but switches up the octaves to give the riffs more texture. She does this signature G major lick, which I can't not sing along with while listening to the song. Then she bounces around the octaves in D to build hype into the pre-chorus riff. In the pre-chorus hard rock riff section, she follows the riff, but plays an octave higher note at the end. Which is a really difficult stretch. And then slides this last riff up to the 12th fret. Misa begins the chorus with a slide and then does what becomes her standard approach for the chorus, hanging out around the third and fifth frets and playing with some cool octaves. Here. But in the second half of the chorus, she starts to play with sliding up to the 12th fret and doing cool licks up there. As you can see, Misa's going pretty much insane during the chorus of this song. A lot of these licks she could have done at the fifth fret and barely have to move from her previous position, but she knows that the slide sounds cool and the notes sound more full on the lower strings. So she puts in the effort to make the slide, but there are several variations she plays throughout the rest of the song. She has a cool lick at the end of the intro riff to lead into the second verse. And then during the second verse, she plays some face-melting riffage in a spot where the bass really takes the lead. And then again, she plays in unison with the guitar and drums for the chromatic descent. This time around, she plays this post-verse riff up on the 12th fret, an octave higher than before. But of course, she goes back down to the original position just to make it even more challenging. But hey, that's within the principles of the song, right? Now the pre-chorus the second time around is even funkier than the first time. But then the second chorus is pretty much the same as the first chorus. Not that it's simple by any means. But then for the guitar solo, Misa just goes absolutely wild, introducing a completely new set of patterns on the bass. For the first half, she plays it relatively simple with the roots, adding a little lick at the end of each line. As you can see, just going back and forth constantly between the two different positions on the neck. And then she goes bananas for the second half of the guitar solo. Adding even more energy and movement to it. Misa does another thick slide to lead into the bridge, doing some sexy slides throughout to add some forward momentum. And she also has this really sexy lick that transitions the bass an octave higher. Before going back down to the low octave and finishing off with this funky feeling slide lick. And once again, for the final chorus, Misa comes up with three more completely fresh progressions. The first time around is the same as the regular choruses, but then a fresh progression. Again, playing back and forth between the original position and the 12th fret. Then she introduces this next progression. Then she plays this catchy little line. 
I love that bluesy feeling lick at the end of that one. But then she has another new progression. Bringing back that gallopy lick from the time before. And ending with some absolutely insane slides from the 12th fret. It's no wonder why so many people hurry to stand in front of Misa at a bandmate concert. There's so much insanity to watch, and until you see it, it's hard to believe that she really plays it live. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. Next week, I have a fun Manners related surprise, which I will link here when it's finished. But otherwise, check out this full Manners series playlist here.